Welcome to this episode of the Duke Football Talk Section 17 podcast. I'm your host, Brian Kennedy, alongside my co-hosts, Josh Cox and Scott Medlin. And for the third straight week, we are down a man yet again. Jamie is on campus as we speak. Another exhibition is going on in this this gym called Cameron Indoor Stadium. I don't know if this sport's going to stick, but you never know. (laughs) All jokes aside, we're here to talk all things football. And before we give our thoughts on everything, let's hear from the man himself. Here's head coach Manny Diaz after the tough loss in Coral Gables. Yeah, uh, congratulations to Miami uh, for winning um, a terrific football game. Um, I think a showcase for the strength of this conference. Uh, and how good this league is. Um, it's a game of turnovers and explosive plays. Um, it's hard to beat anyone on the road if you lose those two battles. It's definitely hard to beat a team as, as talented as they are. And, um, and I thought that was a telling difference in the second half, um, giving an offense like that short fields um, and then allowing the, 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 the quarterback as good enough as it is and, and, and to have breakdowns in our coverage to leave guys wide open um, allowed them to get separation on the scoreboard and, and really take control of the game that they never relinquished. So I'm proud of uh, of the way our guys competed. Um, we came here absolutely believing that we would win the game. And then uh, we played like that. We just made mistakes that were just, that just cost you a football game against anybody, let alone against one of the top-ranked teams in the country. So uh, with that, questions. And again, that was head coach Manny Diaz giving his thoughts post-game after the Blue Devils went down to Miami and unfortunately could not get the job done losing to Miami and before we give our thoughts and jump into the mailbag give our tell the tape this week in Blue Devil sport uh history give our predictions as always you know what we got to do fellas we got to keep the lights on because if without the lights there would be no podcast and first and foremost let's thank Matt Bliven realtor in the triangle area he's a Durham native Duke fan and he's got one more ticket giveaway to do this year folks and it will be for the Virginia Tech game in the coming weeks. So as we get closer, we will let you know what that giveaway is going to be. But if you're looking to buy, if you're looking to sell, if you're looking to invest, if you're looking to build in the triangle, give Matt a call at 919-323-0527 or email him at mlb at nestrealty.com. Josh, let me just say that last week, I that was it was tough for me to thank all the sponsors. So I'm glad you're back, my friend. Who else do we have to thank? Yeah, you know, I'm glad I could be here to shout out our friends at Homefield Apparel. Homefieldapparel.com is your source for uh, high-quality vintage gear. I personally have several pieces uh, from Homefield Apparel. My latest purchase, guys, is the Duke Bomber Jacket. I have the Duke Bomber Jacket. And so if you're a Duke fan and you like vintage apparel, homefieldapparel.com is your stop. Uh, your one-stop shop for all things vintage apparel. But even if you're not a Duke fan or if you're a Duke fan that likes other teams as well, we're not going to hate on you. Um, But you can use our code, Section17, at checkout, and you'll get 15% off your first order. And so I want to encourage you to head to homefieldapparel.com, enter code Section17, and enjoy 15% off. And then finally, we have our friends at Hometown Air. It's getting chilly. Today was a little warm. This week's going to be a little warm, but the nights are getting chilly. Behind me, you see an open window. It's a little chilly. I'm not going to lie. Probably should have closed it before we started the episode. But uh, hometown air can help keep you warm in the winter. Get your system ready to go for the cold winter months. Uh, they have they provide service contracts. This will help your system to run efficiently and smoothly throughout all the seasons that we experience here in the Triangle area. And so if you mention uh, Section 17 podcast, uh, when you sign up for a service contract, they will give you $17 off your first year. You can find out more information uh, and um, secure their services in the Triangle area at hometownairnc.com. That's hometownairnc.com. We want to thank our sponsors. They've been incredible all season long. He switched it up, Josh. It's usually Matt Bliven, then home town, yeah. then home field. So I, I can't be showing any preferential treatment, you know. I gotta switch no, them up no, every no. now and then. For sure, for sure. Well, well, guys, we're just gonna jump right into it. Uh, we could not line up an interview, but it it's another rivalry week 
one that we have been waiting for since last year's 20 to 3 victory. Is that right? 20 to 3? 24. 24. 24 sorry. It's 24 to 3. But uh, we're going to jump right into it. We've got another big mailbag. Thanks to each and every one of you who had submitted questions for all things Miami, all things state, all things just asking questions. And with Jamie being gone, Josh is back at the helm to get us started. So, Josh, what do we have? My back's hurting from carrying Jamie, you know, two weeks now. (laughs) My lower back's killing me. Um, But, yeah, we do have some questions. And, you know, obviously the game Saturday – uh, well, if we'd have ended the game three quarters of the way through, uh, everyone would have gone home happy. But unfortunately, uh, there was a fourth quarter, right? And uh, Duke, uh, you know, didn't didn't play. I don't think to its standards in the fourth quarter. So, um, but we're going to begin. Uh, go through our questions once again. As, as Brian said, thank you for um, submitting questions. We do our best to answer them um, as honestly as we can. Doug Brown. Doug Brown asks, uh, this is on Facebook, have you ever seen two better football players than Chandler Rivers and Jordan Moore? Honestly, it's a thrill to watch them play. It was good to see the video of Jomo's one-handed catch on the cover page of ESPN's NCAA football online page on Sunday. So, yeah, I mean, real quick, so he's, he's referencing the Chandler Rivers uh, interception, the Jordan Moore catch. If, if I can add to that, the Jordan Moore catch is – because the one in the first half, the the uh, back shoulder toe touch, had he not had the one-hander, that's the catch we'd have been talking about. So, guys, give your thoughts on, on those two guys, each on, one on the offensive side of the ball, one on the defensive side of the ball. What are your thoughts on those two players? Go ahead, Scott. I say, hey, man, it's good to see Jordan Moore back healthy. A healthy Jordan Moore, we get to see this stuff every week. It seems like the guy makes catches. And to be honest with you, more people are starting to make those great catches too. We're getting to see everybody catching the football, which is a great thing for this Duke football team. But Chandler Rivers, let's let's be honest. My man, he is doing a great job. What, third game in a row with an uh, interception? Uh, so it's great to see those two guys because we know, we know they're great guys, but they're also very good, great football players. So it's very good to see – gentlemen who do the best of everything they do and be able to put it on their field and show it to the rest of the fans. Yeah. I I echo what Scott was saying. Uh, We know that Jordan Moore has been dealing with uh, an injury for the lot coming or the past few weeks, I should say. So it was good to see him as healthy as he's been since the season started and it showed and that, uh, Man, I, that Odell Beckham Jr. like catch, shout out to Jordan. That was just amazing because as soon as Malik threw the ball, I was like, oh, well, we're going forth. Oh, he made the catch. Okay. Wow. That was, not, I mean, that was a big boy play right there. So I think Jordan's helping his draft stock as well with, with, with stuff like that. If he can just stay healthy for the rest of the season, I, I think it's going to be a good one for Jordan. But, um, yeah, I mean, Chandler continues to impress. I mean, the whole defense continues to impress. Even with the 53-31 to 31 loss, this Duke defense held held Miami a lot of the time and stuck with them until that fourth quarter to where things just kind of blew apart. But, I mean, to going back to what Doug was saying, I don't I, – I mean, fellas, is, can you think off of what we've seen in the years as Duke fans, two players that have been – not so much flamboyant, but just as entertaining as, as those two on the field. Yeah, I mean, the, my thing is this. When is the last time we've had a player on either side of the ball like that that we know uh, we know will be su- playing on Sundays, right? Like, we know both of those guys are going to gonna, gonna uh, get find their way onto an NBA roster. And so, I, I mean, NFL roster, sorry. Uh, so, I think that's the big thing. We haven't had – I haven't – we haven't had a surefire thing like this, I don't think, in a while. Because, you know, you had good college players – but you always, you know, there was always that thought of like, okay, they're going to be good college players and we're not going to really see them on the next level. I think both of these guys are going to be uh, very good on the next level as well. So I do want to follow that up, uh, Doug Brown, uh, with a comment that he had. On a separate note, uh, we should be very pleased with Duke's overall play this year given the changes in coaches and the players from last year. As fans, we should expect Duke's ascent, ascension in, in college football to be a continued march and not a flash in the pan. I, I see continuous improvement this year. 
and forecast more of it for the future. I think as a podcast, we could we could all agree to that. And any any yeah, all right, cool. Well, we will agree to that. Going to the next question, our guy, the Duke of QP. Um, and then also Bentley Weeks um, on Facebook. I, I'll read both questions. Um, did Brewer listen to the pod? This is from the Duke. And find out how many Duke fans wanted him fired. Where has this version of Brewer been all season? The fourth down pass play for a TD was a thing of beauty. And then he mentions what version will show up in Raleigh. And then Bentley asks, do y'all feel like this offense's trajectory is going in the right direction? I feel like the past two games we have showed promise on the offensive side of the ball, but still have plenty to work on. And he asked a question similar. Was Joe Mo's catch the greatest catch in Duke football history? So I, I, I still think uh, – that, that Jameson Crowder catch has got to take the cake there. But let's talk about offense. Overall, those two questions are really focused on what, what we've seen over the last two weeks, uh, seemingly an improved offense, and can Duke sustain that? I, I would think so heading into this game. You played against two stout defenses in SMU and Miami. You're now playing, and, and here's the part where I give stats, so be prepared. Now you're playing – a defense that's ranked 85th in the country in state. They're giving up 30 points a game, average. Their passing defense is 103rd in the country. Take note of that, Duke fans. And their rushing defense is 65th in the country. Very doable. They're giving up almost 400 yards a game. So if the same offense that showed up for SMU and Miami show up in Carter Finley come Saturday at 3.30, I I believe the outcome is going to be very positive for Duke fans because we talked about this last week when Josh wasn't here that Brewer mentioned, and Scott, I think you alluded to it, we're still not fully into the, or they're still still fully not into the playbook 100%. So who's to say that some of the plays that we saw in Miami were plays we hadn't seen yet this year that they tried in practice. It was successful. We saw Jordan on that uh, fourth down pass, which was beautifully called, beautifully called. Um, and who's to say we might not see some new plays this weekend in Raleigh to continue to build on we're learning more and more of the, of the playbook. So I was pleasantly surprised, but I, I will say this, Duke fans, and just be prepared. It always seems like for the first three series of this season it just doesn't work for whatever reason the the set plays that we all talk about that are set before the game just do not seem to work in the first three series but then the fourth series things just start to click um but that's just my thoughts I, again i think if the same offense shows up that shows up showed up for the last two weeks duke's gonna be in good shape yeah it's very it's very pro i mean promising so far looking at the way the team played. And to be honest with you, they start the game, Miami just basically punches them in the face and cannot do anything. But then next thing you know, it's a tie game. It's like, what the heck just happened? But they settled in. And I think it's taken three series. That's the sad part. Um, now, as far as the touchdown catch, it reminded me a lot of the Notre Dame play last year at the goal line where we got the – he ran the same type play on a little drag route and dumped it off to him for the touchdown. Hey, look, at this point, we're seeing things happen that we've not seen yet. They went to a trick play. Queso, yeah, at least he didn't throw a pick. But he also didn't throw it away. But either way, it worked out nicely. But he, but he got the I penalty. Mean, he got the penalty. Exactly, because that was a bad decision on the defensive guy. But – yeah, and I got tired of listening to them mention all that crap constantly. Those two guys drove me insane. That may, that may be one of the plus sides of not being on the ABC network. But anyway, Tessator and Palmer, anyway, I, 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 I digress. But, yeah, it's good to see the offense is starting to get better. Again, point I made a minute ago, everybody's making catches now. The balls are going to the guys. They're making the catches. I mean, jokingly, Talking about Samir, 247, man. Everything coming to him, 247's catching it. And that's a great thing. And it's awesome to see him do well. And to be honest with you, 
other than the uh, Superman punch that almost knocked him out for three weeks, he hurt on the play, but everything else had a great game. So another thing that was awesome to see is just seeing different guys do better. Yeah, shout out to Samir. I mean, uh, you know, Jordan had the uh, the couple highlight catches, but Samir had the touchdown. I mean, he he was he was just he was there the whole game. I mean, um, but I will say on the Jordan Moore touchdown, um, the fourth down conversion. So a couple of things that I really liked about it. I love the pre snap, the full shift. I mean, all five receivers. You know, you saw changing. I mean, Jake Taylor. <laughs> Almost like ran into, you know, I think it was Peyton or Star, whoever it was. Like they were, they were getting to their other spot real quick, and they actually moved Jordan over to the left hand side of the line, almost in like an H back position before he took off there. So that once again, a beautiful play call. And and even as you were watching, and I actually watched the game back again because I was only able to catch bits and pieces over the weekend, but I was able to watch it back again uh, later on, uh, earlier today, and. You know, they were giving Brewer a lot of credit because th- he did call a good game. Um, and and I'll, I'll go back to what you're saying, Brian. You mentioned, you know, we, we struggle in those first three, you know, drives. So maybe that first 15. Okay, like, does that mean Brewer's actually better play caller because he gets better as the game goes on? He makes adjustments as he sees the field. And it's not like, you know, you remember how it was with, with previous, uh, maybe not John's, but previous to that it was like we would do okay for those first three and then the wheels would fall off because as soon as the offensive coordinator actually had to make in-game decisions we couldn't do anything and so like maybe this is the flip of that maybe we just maybe we don't do as well in the week leading up to the game as far as those scripted plays um but you know reading the one-on-one man-to-man coverage that that duke was seeing a lot of those slant passes um i think you know brewer called uh, a fine game and i will say this the last thing Similar play to the Jomo fourth down touchdown. Duke ran it again, and they're getting Malik out of the pocket a little bit and making him use his legs at least to get out of the pocket. And they hit Eli on a first down catch on a similar misdirection. I mean, everybody, uh, he rolled out to the right, and Eli, instead of just hitting Jomo, Eli was behind him, and he hit Eli. So I think there's a lot to be said there um, about the improvement on the offense, for sure. Anybody, anything else on that one? All right. Uh, Regina Lee, shout out to Regina Lee. She was in town at the at the SMU game. We got to hang with her. Stayed in town to go to some other Duke athletics events and whatnot. But she said, I was at the Duke softball scrimmage, so I've only seen parts of the game. She's now back in lower Alabama. Oh, wait, that's Los Angeles, L.A., one of the L.A.s. No, she's in L.A. Louisiana. Um, yeah. <laughs> Oh, man, I'm sorry. Uh, well, I, the first part of her question we already talked about, but the second part we can we can discuss. She said, talk about the offensive progress you've seen over the last two games and where you predict continued movement in the right direction in the back half of the season. Here's the second part of the question I think we can discuss. How, uh, how will special teams continue to progress? So can we talk about that? A little bit of the elephant in the room there. I mean, Duke gets up 11 uh, and decides to squib kick. You know, special teams has given up, you know, touchdowns and the blocked field goal last week that we don't even want to talk about would have been a 30 yard walk off. And we literally didn't move from our snap position, like did not even raise our heads. So what can we what what do we think of the special teams thus far and, and moving forward? I would say the squib kick may have been the thing that hurt the momentum, in my opinion. Um, but. This week in receiving punts, we didn't catch anything inside the 10-yard line, so that's a plus. Um, and a couple times on turning kickoffs, I was like, what in the world are you doing? But it actually worked out a couple times in our favor. So, you know, I, again, I think everything has to give it time. I think we're getting better. I think as a team, the guys that are now getting in there and getting chances to play more, I know we this is week ten, so why in the world? How in the world can I say this? But I think the more confidence they get, the more they play, the better they're getting. And honestly, I would like to. I really wish somebody had asked the question. If I could have been there today, I was going to ask the question. But why did we squib kick? Just to see what the answer was, because I'm sure it was a calculated thing. But we've done so well on kickoffs this season, excluding the one play 
against Florida State. So why change it up? At that time, everything was going right for Miami. It, it, I, I mean, after that point, everything went right for Miami. They they could not do any wrong. They touched the football. They had it at the 50-yard line. A player or two later, it's touchdown. A player or two later, it's touchdown. We make one mistake, miss two tackles. Got two touchdowns for like 75 yards apiece, it seemed like, in like three plays. So, you know, it's just it's frustrating on this side of things. But yeah, I think the squib kick is, is the one is the third and sixteen in, from last year, honestly. Yes. <laughs> I, I mean uh, I I, yeah. I don't have much to add. All I will say is this is that when it comes to special teams, the kicking game something is still going on. Um, I'm not going to say that I, I don't know what's going on. It just seems like t- Todd is off a little bit still. Some of the extra points that he made, even the field goal, a couple of field goals he made in the game, it just didn't seem like his normal projection of his kick. So it could be the hold, it could be the snap, it could be something else. He's making them. That's all that matters. Um, and, you know, we're not going to belabor what happened last week because it wasn't his fault. Uh, when it came to the defender jumping over uh, the line. But needless to say, Todd needed that game to where he was back to making field goals and extra points. So that, that's all I have. on. Yeah, games. and I would say, too, that I feel like, and we've been we've uh, really bragged on this guy uh, this season, but I, I feel like uh, Cade Reynoldson's had a couple of games where he could have, where, you know, he's, he's not been up to his, what he typically does, and that is put the ball inside the 10, 15-yard line on a consistent basis, and there's been, you know. So I, I think I, – here's the thing, though. In order for this Duke team to win games like Saturday and to win games like last week uh, at home against SMU, like your special teams, you, they've got to be on point, right? You can't lose – you can't lose momentum, you lose field position, lose points in special teams and expect to win games against top 25 opponents. Now you might every now and then, but that's going to be the exception, right. To the rule. And so, you know, special teams is important. Um, and, and, you know, they're never, they're never important until, until they struggle. Right. And then all of a sudden it's, it's like on at the front of people's minds. I understand that. Um, Lane. Okay, here we go. I'll go with EEWVU. Is that your guy? Uh, yeah. Eric Elliott. Uh, yeah. Hey, what's him. up, Eric? Hey, he's. Oh, okay. I, and let me say this, folks. Eric is an actual Tar Heel fan at heart. He went to West Virginia, so, but the fact that he engages in, uh, with us almost weekly and asks questions and puts in his predictions, shout out, Eric. I, we appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah, shout out. And this is actually a great question. I uh, do you guys think being so close in back-to-back games against top teams, but coming away with two losses will make the team tougher, or will it hurt them? psychologically uh and then um lane phipps kind of comments on that he he starts out by why do we always have to experience pain in big games as a program he said exaggerations aside i want to comment and say that in spite of the result of the past couple of weeks we're in a good spot miami showed them or showed us that that we can compete with the top five team uh they also showcased the importance of getting points off turnovers because they uh, miami absolutely did and then I hope that Malik's performance this past Saturday pisses him off to where he plays like he has more to prove, take away the picks, and we're looking at a different ball game. So, uh, yeah, what do you think these last two weeks? You know, getting close against two really good teams. Um, where does that kind of leave this Duke team psychologically, in your opinion? Well, we saw it with Miami after the heartbreaking loss to SMU. Scott said that they we got Duke got punched in the mouth 7-0 early. And I, I think I speak for all of, all of us that were watching, at least going, oh, oh, no, here we go. Like, could this be the beginning of the end very quickly? But as has been the case or not been the case in years past, this Duke team didn't just lie down and, and just let the game go, you know, haywire. They stayed you're right. They, they didn't play dead. They got back into it. And as we said, they, they were up 11. I think it was just some uh, some situations to where I equate it to, and I'm trying to think of the game last year to where or the UNC game two years ago in Wallace Wade. I know the refs helped, but it was like Duke was up 15, the victory bell was in hand, and then just lost it, just like that. Um, if 
if it had been something to where this team lost like they did to SMU, and then they lost again to Miami in the same way, I could see it affecting the psyche heading into this weekend's game. But as we saw, even with the tough loss against SMU, Duke played three and a half quarters of, of good football before Miami showed why they were the number four team in the nation now. Also, you got to remember, I, and I, and we talk about this sometimes, back in 2019, if you remember, that UNC game heading in, Duke had a chance to really go on a roll the latter half of the season and potentially, who knows, might have made it as Coastal Champions heading into the ACC Championship, but it was the jump pass that didn't go right. And then after that, the whole season fell apart. And we still talk about that to this day because Duke was on a roll heading into Keenan. It's just, I, I don't I don't see it as affecting Duke moving forward because you got to look at the opponents. State, very winnable. Virginia Tech, very winnable. Wake, very winnable. Now, if Duke doesn't show up to Rale- in Raleigh this weekend, okay, we might need to re- rehash this discussion uh, two weeks from now. But which, by the way, no, no recording next week. Just a reminder, by week, we're all taking a break. So I, I don't think it uh, has affected this team like it has in years past. I would just say, you know, we've always said, and we've said this many times, that you didn't want the, like this week, this coming, this past week, you didn't want the SMU game team to beat them twice. They didn't. They came out, they played, they competed. You know, the same thing has to happen this week. And I think, I think that psyche wise, I think this team knows they can compete. Um, it's obviously a different makeup as la- than last year's team. You know, last year's team, the senior led team that they were, they knew they could compete with Clemson and they showed they could get Clemson's backside. This team has very good upperclassmen, still a lot of pieces that we're trying to put the puzzles together. And we're getting better, obviously, seeing where we're at. And the fact that this any Duke team can compete with the number four team in the country like they did, and then last week compete with SMU like they did and have a chance to win it. I mean, 20 years ago, halftime, these games are over. Not even halftime. Before we get into the second quarter, these games are over. We're like praying that we don't get beat 80 to nothing. So the fact that we're able to compete, we're going blow to blow. Again, Miami is good. Let's just be let's just be straight up. They're really good. Cam Ward should win the Heisman. And I, I mean, I like Hunter, but Cam Ward should win the Heisman. And honestly, unfortunately for Cam Ward, he may be down in Charlotte next season. Unfortunately for him. But other than that, I mean, I think they're doing a great job. I think they're getting better each week. A month ago, I don't know if we'd be having this conversation. I almost know. I don't think we were complacent, but I didn't know that. I, I think personally, I didn't think this offense could get better than it was. And now seeing it rolling, I mean, heck yeah. These are three winnable games. These are three teams that I don't want to say Duke should beat. On paper, they definitely should beat them. But you got to compete. But either way, I think this is an opportunity to go out nine and three, get yourself a bowl in sunny Florida. You just got to do it each week. This Saturday, you got to go to Raleigh because let's, I mean, we're, we're not get ahead of ourselves, but Raleigh's going to be rocking Saturday. They are happy as they can be. They scored 59 points last week and they hate Duke. They hate Duke. Guess what, folks? They hate us. They're going to be enjoying themselves. They're going to go in there thinking they're going to win because, again, that's what state fans do. They think they're going to win a national championship in everything. It doesn't work out, but that's what they think. So I'm going to play a little devil's advocate uh, to to a couple of uh, both of you guys kind of commenting on this about, like, the surprise that this – or not surprise, but, like, this team is going to fight. This team is not going to give up. That's been three years running now. This team has not given up for three years. That is through game one of the Mike Elko regime until now. And so, like, I almost, like, and I know you guys know I give you a hard time about it because I was following the game, and we were down 14 nothing. You guys thought the daggone world had ended uh, on Saturday. Um, but, but like, at the end of the day, like, there has not been a game. You may be able to say the Louisville game last year, potentially, where Duke was like, okay, they, they saw the writing on the wall midway through the third quarter, and they kind of packed it in. But, like, 
they haven't given up. And so, like, I, to me, it's it's now become a part of the Duke football culture that, like, Duke is not going to be an easy out. You know if you play Duke, you're going to get punched in the mouth. You know, you can be up a couple of scores like Miami was, and Duke's going to come back. Like, they're going to figure out a way. And so, like, I and, and that's, that's credit to the guys in that locker room. That's credit to the culture that's being built in Durham. And that's honestly no shade thrown against the David Cutcliffe era. It's just the last two to three years of the David Cutcliffe era, there was a little bit of give up in that in that culture. And it wasn't like that previously, right? Like the 2012 through like the 2018, 2019, as Brian mentioned that year, there really wasn't. I think that 2019 year may have been the shift a little bit. Um, and, and kind of and, and then of course everything happens in 2020 with COVID. But anyway, that's my thoughts. I, I think that, you know, Duke is Duke is that team that is going to fight, and you're not going to get an easy out with Duke. And Duke may make a bunch of mistakes, and the ball might not bounce their way, but they're gonna they're gonna still, you know, you can punch them, and they're gonna get back up. And I I, I hope that that's you know continues to be the culture of Duke football, no matter who the coach is, no matter what the scheme is, you know, no matter who the who the opponent is. Um, there, uh, JD, our guy, Fish Fry O two, he'll be at the NC State game. With three games to go, man, we just talked about this. It's okay, though. Nine and three is a real possibility. How does the coach keep the team together, looking forward and not looking back on thinking about what could have been or pointing fingers? So, I mean, I'll say this real quick, and we may not have much to add to this, but there were some hurt dudes in that locker room after the SMU game. I mean, we all – you saw Samir Hagens on the field after the game, like visibly upset and frustrated. Um, I feel like, and and I, so just so everyone listening understands, no one gets access to this team during during the football season. So like, there's no member of the media or no one that goes to practices and gets to watch practice. The most that happens is a, is the weekly presser that anybody can watch on TV, and so there's no like inside access here. Uh, but I would say from my perspective that if there was going to be the fraction or faction fraction factions within the team, if there was going to be any sort of like um, locker room, you know, tension, it was going to happen in between that SMU loss and this past Saturday. And the fact that Duke made it through that week and got to Miami and played together as a team and did what they did for three quarters, I think answers the question of like, is the locker room intact? is everybody moving forward and not, you know, pointing fingers. Because like I said, if there was a time to point fingers, it absolutely was after the SMU game. You could have pointed fingers in a lot of different directions, if we're honest, right? And if the team came through that week, I think they've come through it for the season. So, all right. Anybody else on that? All right, cool, 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 cool. Peter Dodge. Here goes, he says. I'm at peace with yesterday's loss. So he, he says this on Sunday. Versus a, versus an opponent that was indeed more talented. I also love the way Duke played in the first half after realizing it wasn't a one o'clock kickoff. That's funny. This may be an opinion in the minority, but I truly see the maturation of both Blake Murphy and Jonathan Brewer before our eyes. Folks, it's year one of the Diaz administration. I see a bright future ahead. My question, says Peter Dodge, did the mouth-breathing, high-foreheaded Cretan who punched Samir Hagens in the helmet, break his hand. So let's talk about that play for a second, because in today's world of college football, football in general, NFL, college, there's so much, right? And, and here's the thing. I'm not necessarily against it. There are so many rules and protections made for helmet contact. So what are your thoughts on that? And should what should that have been? Should it have been anything? And yeah. Because it was a very clear punch to the side of the helmet, for sure. I mean, if you watched the Fox game yesterday afternoon at 4 o'clock, there was a helmet-to-helmet that was not a penalty. Dude got kicked out of the freaking game. I mean, I'm like watching, and I'm like, are you kidding me? Are we watching the same thing here? So that frustrated, that frustrated me. Honestly, there's got to be a penalty or something. You can't Superman punch. This is not the UFC. Now, Dana White was probably the happiest person in the world when he saw that video. He's probably going to hire that dude or sign that dude, maybe sponsor that dude for the rest of his career there at Miami. But that's got to be a penalty. I mean, they even mentioned that on TV. 
And the fact that the rules guy even said that, you know, the conference has got to look into that at, during the timeout because they actually went to a timeout because he got hurt. ACC and Charlotte, uh, they were asleep at the wheel again as usual because that's usually what they do. They like to sleep during Duke football games for some reason, as always. Yeah, the, that is an instance to where Charlotte should have pinged down and said, we need to review this. Shout out to Connor O'Neill. I know he hates reviews, but I think even he would have agreed that in that instance, it was so blatant. My man cocked back and to super, I mean, you could just see it. It wasn't just like he was going for the ball and then his hand glanced the helmet. I mean, he straight punched Samir in the temple. So they've got to do something. The NCAA or the ACC won. They've got to have some type of stance to where if it is something blatantly obvious like that, shoot it down to the review, let the ref take a look at it, and then go from there. Because player safety is something that has been discussed for years. We saw Grayson McCall. God bless his heart. I mean, he's now retired from the game of football because of that hit against Wake that, again, a no call. A no call. Uh, and you see these these players, both professionally and collegiately, who are stretchered off the field with hits like that. Now, thankfully, uh, Samir was not injured but when it comes again to targeting, when it comes to blows to the head, you, you gotta you gotta make the call a, as a conference, as you know, a head official, something. You've got to do something moving forward. Yeah, I agree with you guys. I, I, I'll give two pieces of feedback on it. First of all, that play is the definition of unnecessary roughness. I mean, that is the definition. That is unnecessary roughness. So that 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 covers it, and it should be targeting. If you if he did that with his helmet, then it's targeting, and he's and he's kicked out of the game. So you can't do it with your fist. My second piece of feedback: we live in a society, a football society, and a football culture, where Deshaun Stone got flagged for roughing the passer against Georgia Tech for literally stumbling up on the on the quarterback and touching him after he threw the pass. And we got flagged, and that was, in my opinion, that lost the game. Not not Deshaun. That call lost the game for Duke in Atlanta. And then you have this play that doesn't get any sort of a flag. And so it's broken. Um, and I'm not for over-regulation, but I am for if we're going to say it's player safety, then we need to be about player safety, right? And, 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 and there are more players on the field than just the quarterback. We need to understand that. So um, anyway. Scott, I, I would just say this, the, after the Oregon, Ohio state game, they did the Dan Lanning rule where you can't have 13 guys on the field or 12 guys on the field, knowing what you're doing that week, they took care of it. I've not heard a thing yet. We're the only people probably talking about it right now in this whole world. And you can't do that. It just, it just, it's just not right. Somebody, you know, my, my man needs to get off the Notre Dame train for a few minutes and pay attention to that video and do something about it. As much as it pains me to say this, it I feel like it's going to take a catastrophic injury for these conferences and even the NCAA to say, okay, we need to take a step back and we need to review this and how we do our procedures when it comes to in-game penalties to this nature, not all penalties, but severe penalties like this. Yeah, listen, and we'll go after this, but we've all taken a second round here. I mean, we have to remember, I know they're saying that both Grayson McCall and Samir Hagans were not defenseless in any way because they were running the football with the football. But you got to remember that Grayson McCall hit an injury was not called targeting. It wasn't. And my man, it retired him from football. Um, and he got, I mean, it was absolutely a blow to the head. Absolutely, 100% a blow to the head. And this one wasn't either. And so, once again, I'm just for some logic and some reason and some consistency across the board. Let, if we're going to let if we're gonna let this happen, okay, we'll let it happen. But also, we can go in and, and smack the crap out of the quarterback as soon as he lets go of the football. Let's go to the football and you better not throw the flag, right? Like, let, we can't have it both ways, right? So, Anyway, I, I appreciate the question, uh, Peter, because I think it was wor a worthy discussion um, to have. And I think that, you know, I know this. I know that the coaching staff can send in every week. They can send in, and they do send in 
you know, different feedback, um, you know, for the officiating. And I'm hoping that that was sent in uh, this week. Jonathan Huggins has a question for um, our bulletologist who hopefully does better than Joe Lenardi does on his uh, March Madness brackets. Um, but Brian, with how we played in Miami, do we believe nine and three is still possible with the Duke's Mayo Bowl? Yes, and I will say why. So with the playoff system now in play, obviously twelve the 12 best teams, not ranked teams, but best teams get into the playoffs. And looking at the ACC standings, you've got Miami undefeated and SMU at 8-1. Eight, eight and one. If everything plays out, those and you got a two-loss Clemson team, right? Technically right, still in the mix. Right, but I'm just saying, let's say that SMU and Miami went out. They're, they're going to go. They're both going to go to the ACC title game. And more than likely, regardless of the outcome, both teams could potentially be in the playoff. Now, one thing that happened last year and in years past that's not happening anymore, the loser of the ACC title game, if the winner went on to the BCS or whatever it was back then, they would go to the Orange Bowl. The Orange Bowl is actually in the, the semifinals of the playoffs this year. So you have to take that away. Throw in a 7-1 and one pit team. Throw in Clemson, like you said, Josh. Let's just say that Clemson doesn't make it the ACC title game. Throw in Syracuse at 6-2. and two. Louisville, 6-3. and three. You've got a lot of teams right now vying for the same spots. And if you remember, other than the Orange Bowl, you go Pop-Tarts and Gator. Those are your two big ones. I used to say nine and three would get you there, but I mean, there could be a 10 and two team playing down there right now. Looking at these records, Pitt could, let's say Pitt ends 10 and two and Clemson ends 10 and two. Those two teams are going to the Gator and the Pop-Tarts just don't know which, which one. So yeah, nine and three would get you in the Duke's Mayo Bowl, but it's a lot, it's a crowded space right now because Duke would be going up against Louisville. And and you got to remember and I know I'm, I'm going all over the place, but I'll try to explain it. If you have Duke at, say, 9-3, and three, and you've got another team at 8-4, and four, and that bowl committee wants the 8-4 and four team because of traveling fan base, guess what? They can leapfrog Duke. Now, if Duke's 9-3 and three and someone's 7-5, and five, that doesn't work out. So Duke needs to win out to be in Charlotte based off of what I'm seeing. Um, yeah, because – Can I Duke's, ask a question? Mm -hmm. uh, Notre Dame uh, – it, it, would, it, would other help, it would help Duke for Notre Dame to be in the college football playoff. 100% because if Notre Dame does not get in, then they take an ACC bowl bid, which happened last year. That caused all the calamity because we initially thought Duke was going to be in the Gasparilla Bowl. They were named for a second. Then the post got taken down, and then Duke got moved to the Birmingham Bowl because they didn't want to rematch with USC. UCF from the year past in the military bowl. So, so we'll, we'll reach out to RJ Oban and to Riley Leonard to make sure they continue their uh, winning ways up there in South Bend. It'll help us out a little bit. And, and, and even with all the craziness, coastal, coastal chaos is prevalent in the ACC this year. There are still, there's seven teams that have clinched a bowl berth. There are still eight teams that could potentially go bowling in the ACC. Now I did look at some of them, Virginia, They've got a tall task ahead of them to try to get two more wins because of their opponents. I see UNC clinching a bowl bid. I see State clinching a bowl bid. Boston College, they're four and four. I could see them getting in. Cal as well. Um, Virginia and Virginia, I'm sorry, Virginia Tech and Georgia Tech, they're one win away each. So, you know, I put out bowl projections last year because it was a lot easier. I'm not touching it. I'm like, I'm going to be like Josh. I'm going to wait till the last week of the season to try to figure out where everyone will go. But right now, it is just too early to call. And just to you know, follow up on what you just said, Pitt, Virginia this week, Clemson next week, the Ville next week. So they could potentially play themselves down to three losses or – play themselves up depending on what happens because Clemson's obviously beatable and it's up there at Pittsburgh. And I mean, you, you never know. I'm just saying. So, and, and we, and again, based off these records and I don't know the full ACC schedule with these last four weeks remaining, but some of these teams, like Scott just said, they could be 
seven and one, six and two, even six and three, and they could wind up being seven and five, six and six. We just never know how the ball is going to drop. Did you say we don't never know how the ball is going to drop? Aaron Judge. Drop. He's gonna he's gonna help drop the ball at New Year's Eve. That's, you seen that? You seen that? Yeah, meme? yeah, I did, I did, I did. I was I was thinking more like a middle school middle schooler uh, with that, but hey, it's all good. All right, Beavis and Butthead. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Uh, I gotta read this guy. It's it's supposed to be like SpongeBob with a bunch of numbers. It's a it's a X account. It's like SpongeBob seven seven eight seven eight three zero zero. Unfortunately, Duke did not win this weekend. I feel a big part of it was turned was it turned into a shootout. I'm glad Duke's offense is creating explosive, explosive plays. However, the Duke run game was not as good. Do you think it's a scheme, O-line, or both? And then his part two to kind of f- follow up on that, um, I believe Duke needs to stop running inside zones and start pulling guards and tackles and run the ball outside more. A lot of our big runs have been r- the running backs bouncing the run outside to spread the defense. And then Terrell Harris mentions the run game as well. If our run game was a little better, we could maybe have been able to go on eight to ten play drives, which would have kept Miami's offense off the field. Our defense did look a little tired in that fourth quarter, but they really do a great job. So talking about the run game um, and its struggles and scheme-wise for the from the Miami game. Um, I, I agree and disagree with everything that was just said. Um, I, the pulling, pulling tackles and guards, great idea. However, Duke, when they go this way, no bueno, no bueno. They went that way two or three times and they lost three yards. You got to go this way. Got to go that way. This whole running sideways mess to try to beat somebody. It's not going to work against Miami. It's not going to work, work against these other teams. Run straight up the middle. That's why you have the six guys there. And honestly, the O-line, again, great job. For the most part, they kept Malik clean. He had one one play, I think, where he got sacked, and that was just, it is what it is. But one of the things that, again, I just don't get it. Now, I would like to see some of the pulling guard stuff. I am agree with that 100%. But we were down, we were down picket. Saturday, and we got to see Belushi slash Horatio Sands stand in double there. Sakakian, Sahakian, Micah Sahakian. Well, yeah. yeah. So we just call him Belushi Jr. We got to see him in there, and he did a great job, honestly. And like Manny mentioned today, he's not even a tackle; he's a guard. So that was one of the things, you know, seeing a guy in a position he's not ever really played against the number four team in the country, and to do as good as he did. Heck yeah, sign me up for that all day. And now he's in the rotation, which gives us one more healthy body. Hopefully Pickett is healthy this week, and he said he thought he would be. So just, you know, stuff like that. The healthier we get, the better we run the ball at the middle. Against Miami, though, once you got down, it was kind of hard. Running the football is just not something you want to do when you're down four touchdowns. That's the one downside to me. We weren't down four touchdowns, Scott. Why are you so negative? I'm sorry. I was watching the Broncos yesterday down four touchdowns, see, and see? It, it screwed up my mind. So that's what it felt like. <laughs> I was going to say, me and Scott had had rough days yesterday. Jamie and and Josh were actually happy that the Panthers squeaked one out against the uh, the yeah. Saints. Hey, the Panthers are now uh, one of like six or seven two law two. I'm sorry, two win teams in the NFL. It's kind of it's kind of wild, kind of interesting. But that's not what we're going to talk about. All I'm going to say is this, Duke fans, you got to remember, Duke went up against the eighth best rushing defense in the country in Miami and the week before that the fifth fifth best rushing defense in the country so when you play two top 10 rushing defenses back to back it's going to be hard to get the yards on the ground but again as I stated earlier heading to Raleigh state gives up uh, 143 rushing yards a game 65th in the country so hopefully we'll see some improvements on the ground this weekend yeah, and, and you guys know I've been a little critical of the offensive line and run blocking. Um, but I will say, man, like they're what they've won me over as far as like the way they can protect. Um, and you know, I, I don't necessarily I, I didn't at least this week, I'm not necessarily blaming the offensive line for our lack of running the ball. You guys have mentioned it kind of the way the game was going. I mean, it just it did made more sense, 
you know, and, and by the way, I want to give a shout out because uh, he got kind of thrown into this position and he's improving and, and I think getting better every week. And that's Jake Taylor. Um, I thought he played a good game. He had a good game in, in Miami um, and blocked reasonably well. And then Tony Boggs and, and Bullyard was out there on some of the passing downs <clears throat> as well. And so the, the tight end room, while it is, you know, minus two starters, um, you know, th- those guys are improving and it's, it's good for them to get, you know, those reps for sure. Uh, I, I was mistaken. Sorry. The NCAA must have updated their stats before uh, or after I had looked. State's actually the 73rd best rushing defense. So they actually dropped a couple pegs from 65th to 73rd. Oh, I'm sure they're happy about that. All right. Um, oh, we mentioned this already, but did anyone else get a sinking feeling in their gut after the squib kick? Um, and a similar question that was from, Hey, wait, what? Huh? On X. And then also at blue devil, two K 10, what happened to flip the momentum? So completely from being up 28 to 17 to ending the game, being outscored three to 29. feels like we forgot how to play football for 20 to 25 minutes. I think both those two questions may, uh, piggyback on one another, right? That squib kick. Scott, you already mentioned it. That may have been the momentum turning point. You can't give that offense the ball at the 50-yard line, right? I mean, that's just a momentum killer. And, you know, Duke didn't recover from that from that point forward, right? All right. They're in agreement. They're in agreement. All right, cool. So, yeah. So, you hit the nail on the head, guys, uh, uh, you know, with those two questions. I mean, Really feel like that squib kick did not help us in any way, shape, or form. Um, would have much rather that ball been on the 25-yard line, kick it through the back of the end zone, which I think should actually be the strategy pretty much for every kickoff. That's just my unprofessional opinion. But um, Here's a question from Jacob Carver on Facebook. I'm not smart enough to understand the defense. Is there something we could have done differently in the second half to slow down Cam Ward and the, that dynamic offense? It seems like we had a good idea in the first half, but lost in the second half. Hopefully we take the experience and are more prepared the next time we face a dynamic offense like this. I'll I'll comment and then give it to you guys. We did miss a, a few tackles. And I understand Restrepo and those guys were like, they're really talented, right? They're really talented. But, I mean, we were in cover two and, like, the classic. Like, he got in between the two safeties and, like, we tripped over each other basically out there trying to tackle on that one on that one uh post route um that's not that's not ideal um so yeah I, I do think the defense I think we have to be honest right we've we've we know our defense is good and we brag on them all year long but like that was not a good defensive performance and the question that I really have an extension of what they asked of what he asked is you know was this more Miami's just that good or was this like a legitimate like you know, we, we wet the bed defensively in the second half. I would, I mean, honestly, watching Cam Ward back there, my man was, I hate to make comparisons, but he looked like the little midget Johnny in Atlanta. Pure wetting around people, dancing around. Oh, man, throws. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about, like, Kirk Cousins or, like, no, honestly, no, no, okay, no. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah from no, from, I got from to, 2013. I got, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, got, I got to see the tiny version of Johnny in front of me all night talking about Johnny, Johnny, Johnny. I wanted to punch the crap out of that dude. But anyway, um, look, the first touchdown pass was pure T luck. I mean, guy slips, ball gets tipped, Restrepo just happens to be standing there. Are you kidding me? That's why you know you're having a magical season. Then he finally got a little uh, little cocky, shall we say, with his little whatever crap that is they do. And he hit Chandler Rivers in the chest because he thought he was Brett Favre throwing him back across his body that had no prayer of completing that pass. So, you know, but the guy's good. And he was everywhere. He was moving around. And he's so quick. And they kept running plays where, you know, he gets the ball and half a second later, the receiver has it just flip another wrist and honestly hopefully the, I, I hope to never see him again in a college uniform i hope he does a great job makes millions of dollars 
even if it is with the Panthers. I hope he does a great job down there in Charlotte. But, I mean, I think that's what the big thing was. We really did a decent job against the defense, against the running back. He really didn't have – neither one of them had a great game. Now, at the end, we, we did give up a touchdown. And they did bully ball us on a couple of plays where they didn't blow the whistle. Their own line basically picked him up and carried him an extra seven yards and dropped him. But you got to stop that. You got to make them stop. So I think all in all, it was they played a pretty good game. They got tired fourth quarter. You know what Josh just referenced when you run into each other as you're trying to make a tackle and Restrepo goes right by you and it happened to be the record breaking one of all things. It sucks, but I, I, I love where we're at. Again, we don't have to see Miami again this year, thank God. We probably won't see another top five team the rest of the season. So, hey, live and learn. Move on to the next thing. Difference between a good and a great team right now. I mean, that that's where Duke wants to be. That's where Duke fans want this team to be. I mean, Miami, they just covered all facets on the ground and the air. I mean, I, I'll, I'll take it a step further. I would say Cam Ward looked like Lamar Jackson more than anything, being able to – get out of tackles, get out of sacks. There were times where I thought that Miami would be facing second and long, third and long. Nope. Popped out out of nowhere, and Cam Moore was able to just throw the ball down the field, and his uh, receivers were able to make the catch. So, I mean, kudos to Miami. Uh, you know, to qu- quote the great Dennis Green, they were who we thought they were. Well, me, Scott, and Jamie, not Josh. Josh thought it was they weren't, so I had to, I had to throw that out there. Um, but, yeah, I mean, to have, again – I know I, I try not to bring up the PTSD, but had this been Duke Miami, let's say four years ago, game would have been over in the first quarter, and it would have been like night night. What's on? What's on another station or another channel? So um, that that is where Duke wants to be. Yeah, I agree with that. That that Miami is the standard right now, um, right in the SEC. And I mean, as as much as that pains me to say, because I don't like it but it is what it is. Kevin Trapani, uh, we've already, um, we've already mentioned this, so I'll just read this question. Um, how's the locker room? Two tough losses against excellent teams last year. We folded at the end of the year. I don't necessarily agree with that, but that's okay. This year we can win out and go to a solid bowl if we're together as a team. So how strong is our culture? And I think I will give you two words for how strong is our culture. David Feely. That's how strong our culture is. So, you know, we've already kind of spoken about this, but I appreciate the question. And I do disagree that we, that we like faltered all at the end of last season. I think it was part of the schedule. It was also that Duke team last year was so beat up with injuries and for them to come back and and play as well as they did in the bowl game, like said a lot about the culture. So once again, I'm going to, I'm going to choose and I'm not discrediting the history of Duke football but I'm going to choose to believe the last three years, two and a half years is the new Duke football culture. And so, yes, this team will finish the year strong and it might not mean they win all three games, but I feel like they will finish the year strong. All right. So we have, um, thank you. Bleeding Duke blue, Sam. Uh, congrats. I went on last week. So congrats on your world series win there for the Dodgers. Um, having not watched, uh, much of North Carolina State since being led by C.J. Bailey. What should Duke fans expect from the North Carolina State offense, and how will Duke match up with them defensively? Also related, was the Stanford game more about the state offense or a bad Cardinal defense? I think I have an opinion on a couple of those things. But what are we what are we looking at? The first thing I'll say is, you know, Concepcion was the guy coming into the season. That was going to be all that. And he is good. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's not like the guy doesn't have the talent, you know, that he, that he's always had. Um, but they, he's just not gotten the football. And he's not been as productive this year. Justin Jolie, who is a uh, transfer, he technically is a tight end. I think he's really like a wide receiver. Uh, but but he's, he's a tight end. Leads, their, leads them in, in receiving yards um, and has been solid no matter who the quarterback is. So it doesn't matter who was back there. He's been solid. Um, what else do we know about this state team that we ought to be looking for on the offensive side of the ball? Um, our friend. He had a 95-yard touchdown last week, and I'm not going to lie to you. It was kind of similar to the state game last year here in Durham. He got about to the 40-yard line and hit another gear. And honestly, 
it was, you know, it was good to see Jordan Waters back because he's had, he's had some stretch where he's not had great games. And they have like a two or three headed monster back there. And Bailey does have some wheels also. Uh, Concepcion, I mean, he's the man. He's the, had a great year, but Joe Lee is the good. Um, I think that Duke has a shot against them. Um, if they can contain Bailey, I think they're okay. If they can, I don't know how good State's offensive line is. Now, that's something you've not been able to say in the past about NC State. And I'm not saying they're bad, so don't get me wrong. Kyler, if you're listening, don't say I'm not saying anything oh, bad. Kyler, about that Kyler told me earlier last week that he thinks they're bad compared to what they okay. should have been with the returning so, all the starters and stuff that they had. So hearing that now, I do like Duke's chances against them because our D line, our linebackers, you know, it is what it is. You got to contain them. Now, scoring 59 points, the most they've ever scored in ACC football history, tells you two things. One, they had a great day. And two, Stanford sucks. Let's just be honest. Stanford's god awful. They are the worst team in the conference, and that's that's not stretching it at all. They're really bad. Not taking anything against State because you have to play the game, and they went out and scored the 59 points. So, you know, it, it is what it is. Bailey has done a great job, though. He's actually been fun to watch. I really hope we get to see him laying on his back more than he's standing up Saturday because that would be a whole lot more fun for us if he's laying on his back and they're not going anywhere with the football. So can I make a comp, a Bailey comp, Scott? And you've watched, cause you've watched state, uh, quite a bit now he's taller, but just in his like potential of like what I think he could be, there's a little bit of that, like Jaden Daniels, like, like he can yeah, run fair. the football. He's fast. And he, I mean, he can throw like the Jaden Daniels can do both. He's, he's an accurate passer. I um, mean, he can run and I'm not, I'm not at all saying that Bailey is there. I'm just trying to think of like a player comp, right? Of like, you know, a taller I version a great of that. Comparison. I think that is a great skinny, comparison. He's like he's thin, yes. he's thin like that. Like, and the kid's only what, 18, 19? Yeah, he's a true I think freshman. he's a soft. He's, he's a true freshman. True freshman. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so he was not planning on playing. Obviously, and Lord forbid. I'd much rather see Grayson McCall back there, just because knowing Grayson McCall is not hurt and didn't have to retire for that part. But Bailey has done what he was supposed to do. And unfortunately, last couple of years over in Raleigh and in Durham, to be honest with you, you've had to learn on the fly. And it's not where you want to be as a college football program. Y'all done? <laughs> um, just based off of what I did in my research, because you, you guys have more of an insider track with NC State with Kyler and, and his family and stuff. I would say that you've got to contain Bailey, like Scott was saying earlier, because – Based off of what I found, they have a top fifty passing game, but they have a they have the one hundred and first best rushing offense. So it's almost mirror what Duke is doing right now when it comes to offenses. So it's going to be interesting to see who bends but doesn't break from defense to offense. So I think if you take Bailey out of the game, if you if you make him uncomfortable, if you take Concepcion out and you force them to have to run the ball. I mean, I could see it as being a grudge match. I mean, no, nothing but love to Jordan waters, but I could see some of the Duke guys that know Jordan would be like, Oh, okay. We got something for you. Why, why don't you come through that line and we'll show you what we have. So. Yeah. My question about their run game. And I, and by the way, Jordan, Jordan waters is averaging like almost five and a half yards a carry, but one carry for 95 yards really helps your, your yards per carry on the season. I, I don't know that they're actually giving, they're actually running the ball that often, right? Like I think they're rush. I think they kind of gave up on the run a little bit, you know, after after a three to four games into the season where they were struggling, um, and you know I think they've they've really thrown the ball more. Uh, we're we're gonna see. I mean, I, I believe that Duke, uh, Duke's defense uh, is going to cause them problems. That they, they are one hundred percent. To Scott's point, 281 rushing yards and five touchdowns for State. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that, that that'll that'll be the that'll that'll be and, what happens. And then, but, um, honestly, I, I, just to follow up one thing real fast, Hollywood Smothers, when he's in there, he's had a great year. I mean, the numbers don't show it. He's only got 267 yards rushing, but he is effective when he's in the game, and he does a really good job. And, and in all honesty, three-headed monster in the backfield to me. Bailey, Waters, and Smothers, that's not a bad thing for them. 
I mean, Dave Dorn, I know, is happy with that because they loved it. Uh, what's his name? The OC. And Robert and I. And I. Yeah, he's it was great there at Virginia when when he did his thing with Armstrong those years. So cool. Uh, well, that was all the questions. We do want to thank you, uh, our listeners, for sending in those questions. We also want to thank El Rodeo Mexican Restaurant on North Duke Street. Um, El Rodeo is our Iron D sponsor, and they have great Mexican food, drinks, atmosphere. Um, currently their parking lot is getting repaved, but they're still open if you happen to drive by there. So FYI, um, but make sure you hit that up. Uh, unlimited chips and salsa. Of course. Um, I, I get the fajitas when I go most of the time. I also get the sopes every now and then I saw Scott. I saw that. Um, but, uh, but, um, so hit it up there. Let them know you listen to the section 17 podcast. Um, and, uh, you know, they will probably look at you like they don't know what you're talking about, but that's going to get back to the owner. And that'll help us out. And if you do happen to go there and you think about it, take a picture, send it to us or post it. And we always appreciate that. So shout out to our uh, friends and sponsor at El Rodeo. We are heading into uh, another week of Duke football, another week of looking back into the Duke football lore, the historical amazing feats of Duke football. Scott, what do you have for us this weekend, this week in Blue Devil history? We'll warn everybody, it's really hard to sit here on Monday nights and not have everything going on behind the screen when I'm doing this stuff. But anyway, this week in Duke football history, we're going to go back 10 years ago to November the 8th, 2014. The Blue Devils travel up to squeeze the orange, shall we say. The game was tied at 10-10 early in the fourth quarter. They decided to punt, which was a bad decision, to Jamison Crowder, who returned to 52 yards to put the Blue Devils ahead for good. Anthony Boone was 15 of 33, not the greatest of days, but 161, two touchdowns and one INT. Shaq Powell led the Blue Devils on the ground with 68 yards rushing. Our guy Isaac Blatney had one of his best games, three catches, 94 yards receiving, and two touchdowns. Byron Fields, Brian Fields had eight tackles. Devon Edwards, Mr. Wolf, Wolfpack loves that guy, by the way. And David Helton had seven tackles. That put made Duke eight and one on the season after that win, which that was a really fun year. But hey, that was this week in Duke football history. Nice, nice, nice. We went up to squeeze the orange up there. Um, and by the way, you mentioned the Anthony Boone stat line. Shout out Anthony Boone. Love that guy. But imagine, just imagine. The Duke fans of this year and the unrealistic, ridiculous expectation that they have put. Imagine if Malik Murphy's stat line was 15 to 33 for 167 yards, two touchdowns, and an interception. They would be like screaming for him to be benched, like especially this late into the season. So, anyway, I digress, but like, anyway, um, thank you, Scott, for doing that. We appreciate it every week. Uh, Brian, tell the tape. Week, yes. what week are we in? Week ten? Because oh, we had a bye week. Uh, yes, we are. Week yeah, because six and three, six and three, nine, and this is week ten, and we had the bye week. Well, don't forget week oh, zero. Yeah, exactly. Whatever. <laughs> week eleven. It's it's week eleven, Brian. <laughs> we are playing the NC State Wolf Pack. Wolf. Is that, is that how you do it? In Carter Finley, let's face it, in the best environment in the triangle, in the state for college football, we will be there. We are tailgating with the Iron Dukes, by the way, uh, fans. So the Iron Dukes tailgate uh, is right outside the Lenovo Center, which is the former PNC Arena. So come and hang out with us there. We will be tailgating. Brian, tell us more on this week's tailgate. Another fun one against an in-state rival at the North Carolina State Wolfpack last year. NC State went 9-4 and four and went to the Pop-Tarts Bowl where they were defeated by Kansas State 28-19. to Currently, NC State is 5-4 and four and 2-3 and three in conference play. Last week, as we just talked about, the Wolfpack defeated Stanford handily in convincing fashion, 59-28. Now, head coach Dave Dorn is in his 12th season with the Wolfpack and has an 
109 and 56 overall head coaching record, and he is also four and five in bowl games. And before taking over at NC State, Dorn was the head coach at Northern Illinois from 2011 to 2012 and had assistant coaching stints at Wisconsin, Kansas, Montana, and Drake. Now, this is the 84th all-time matchup between Duke and NC State, with Duke leading the series 42-37 to with five ties. The first ever meeting between Duke and North Carolina State took place on September 27, 1924 at the now-defunct Riddick Stadium in Raleigh, where State would defeat Duke 14-0. to After that first game, the two teams would play every year until the 2003 season when things just got jumbled up. And since 2003, Duke and State have only met five times in the last 20 years, 21 years that is, before the new scheduling model came out last year. Now moving forward, I think to all Duke and State fans' pleasure, they're going to play every year. It needs to be that way. I mean, we're talking 15 miles apart. Duke and State will play every year for the foreseeable future. And let's talk about last year. Last year, Duke defeated State 24-3 in Durham. And this was the first win for the Devils over State since 2013 when they defeated the Wolfpack 38-20. And the last time State defeated Duke was in 2020 when they won 31-20 in Raleigh. That, of course, is the last time the Devils were at Carter-Finley Stadium. And head coach Manny Diaz is 2-0 all-time against NC State, having won both games during his time as Miami head coach. And now it's time for Did You Know? Just after World War I, NC State, then North Carolina State College of Agriculture and Engineering, was establishing a new identity. For years, the school had been given many nicknames, from the Aggies to the Farmers, even the Techs, but nothing stuck. Then in February of 1921, an anonymous alumni sent in an unsigned letter to the school's newspaper with a suggestion for the school that fit perfectly. The letter read, quote, It has always appeared to me that those teams which had traditional symbols and nicknames have the greatest morale and spirit among the colleges. Take, for instance, the Yale Bulldog, or the Princeton Tiger, and the Carolina <coughs> Chapel Hill College Tar Heels. With many others, these names add a picturesque touch to those colleges, which I have always thought reacted favorably on the playing of the team. Not to speak of the added drawing power of something like the Gold Tornado from Georgia Tech. Pride is taken in these names, and teams traditionally try to leave up, live up to them. Now, my suggestion is that state teams take up the symbol of the Wolves. Here is a snappy, aggressive name which would have a most favorable effect on the college. To have the state team known as the Wolfpack would add tremendously in publicity. While the original copy of the letter has since been lost, the suggestion was never officially discussed with the Athletics Board at that time. Fans and alumni unofficially called the team the Wolfpack by that name, while the local press would continue to call the team by their old nicknames. Finally, in 1946, new school chancellor John Harrelson, who had returned from the war, suggested the Wolfpack name be retired after the Wolfpack name had been associated with German Navy subs during World War II. Harrelson would offer the student body six season tickets to the 1947 season to whoever came up with the best nickname for the team. However, after some less than inspiring nominees were suggested, the student body unanimously voted to make the Wolfpack name official for all sports, and the chancellor would ultimately relent. And the rest, as they say, is history, and that was the tale of the tape for the NC State Wolfpack. Josh? So you're telling me Wolfpack is basically Nazi. Is that what you're basically... You said it. I'm not saying another word. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, But anyway, um, awesome. So... We want to thank you for uh, for consuming our podcast wherever you consume it. If you consume it visually, <laughs> then you get to look at our ugly faces. Uh, but on YouTube, we appreciate it. Subscribe, comment, like, share. Uh, Apple, Spotify, five star ratings are awesome. Reviews on 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 Apple are really good. We really appreciate them. Um, and yeah. Um, Facebook, Duke Football Talk is our group. We have about 3,200 strong uh, going in the Facebook group now. Uh, we try to keep it cleaned up. Let me just say this on our Facebook group to our Facebook fam. Uh, you, 
I really hope you appreciate the fact that we do not allow people to post during the game. A couple of the other Duke football groups, like it's it's they it spams my Facebook timeline. And I just see people commenting on like single plays or like frustrated during a game. And it's so anyway, it's so frustrating to see that like after the fact. So anyway, we try to keep it all uh, organized and neat and tidy in there. We appreciate it. Uh, you uh, being on Facebook with us and then Instagram, uh, X, Twitter, TikTok, I do FB talk. We appreciate that as well. We're going to be uh, tailgating. We mentioned it. Iron Dukes this week. We want you to come out and hang out. I believe the Iron Dukes tailgate is like 35 bucks, but it comes with all the food and everything that you want there. And I will say this is the tailgate, like hard hat guys will be there. Like this is kind of the tailgate for the week. So there's not going to, we know of obviously Duke fans can tailgate on their own, but we don't know necessarily of any, of any specific tailgates going on other than that one. And so we want to encourage you to come take part of that. Enjoy the atmosphere at Carter Finley. Scott and I have been to Carter Finley more times than we can think. It's a great place to watch a football game. Yeah, state fans are state fans. We get it. We understand. But it is a great place to watch a football game. And so uh, enjoy yourself there. Um, it's time. Predictions. Last week, we got to uh, figure out who or uh, find out who our winners are from last week. And then we will tell you what we think is going to happen this Saturday in Wallace. I mean, in Wallace, wait, in Carter Finley. Brian. Who won last week? All right. So on Facebook, Chris Berry predicted Miami to win 45 to 21. So pretty close to the actual score. On X, Robert Rigsby at the Blue Devil Rob predicted Miami to win 42 to 20. And I believe on the Insta, we have a back to back winner, Regina Lee predicted Miami to win 31 to 20. So two weeks in a row for the most fair weather fan. That Duke knows. Just kidding, Regina. You said that, not us. Um, so, Scott and us, we we have reached out to you, to the winners. We will um, not be – we'll have one this week. And then, of course, next week with the bye week, we're all going to take a break. Now, as far as this week, 3.30 ACC Network in Raleigh. Getting ready for it, fellas. Duke is actually entering the game as a three-point underdog. I don't think any of us expected to see that. The over-under is 50 and a half points. I'm going to go ahead and get going because Jamie sent in his uh, prediction before he entered Cameron Indoor tonight. He's got Duke winning, and he's got Duke going over the over. He's got Duke winning 31 to 23. And as far as his jersey combo, he's got Duke wearing the icy whites yet again. With that big, blue, luscious D. Now, as far as I go, and I cheated a little bit, I went back to see what Duke wore in 2020 when they were last in Carter Finley. They went white, white, blue. So white helmet, white top, blue bottoms. Um, I think they're going to do it again. White, white, blue. And I think the big, blue, luscious D is on the helmet. Now, I stated this earlier. I said that State typically gives up around 31 points a game. That's 104th in the nation out of 133 schools. Duke's giving up right now an average of 22.4 points a game. So I had to go with the stats. I'm going Duke 31, State 21. I see Duke getting back on track, getting that seventh win of the season as they head into the bye week. Who's next? Uh, I'll go next. I'm I'm chuckling at at you going back to what Duke wore in 2020 at NC State and thinking that like that's what they're gonna wear four years later because that's what they did the last time. Hey man, I I just gotta try something different, you know. Knowing I, that I, Manny, knowing that Manny has repeatedly said he just lets the players pick. It, okay, I know what's coming then. Black, white, black, white, black, white. <laughs> One of those. <laughs> I would like, I would be down for some white, black, white this week just to make Brian mad. But I don't think it's going to happen. I'll go with, uh, I think Duke's going to go kind of like a traditional old school. I think they're going to go blue, white, blue with the blue, with the, with the D on the helmet. Blue, white, blue, D on the helmet. We actually haven't done that, I don't think, this year. Actually, we haven't had the D on the helmet. Have we had the D on the helmet? All season? So let me change that. Gothic. So blue, white, blue, gothic, Duke. Because I don't think we're necessarily going to bring bring the D out 
this late into the game. So, um, we haven't yep. seen the D. We haven't seen the D all season. Yep. All right. Well, um, my score prediction. As I was saying it, I'm going, Lord, that's not good. So anyway, my score prediction. I think the offense has found its rhythm. I think there's, as we've mentioned, they are playing against a defense that is definitely not Miami's. Um, I think Duke scores this week. I'm going Duke 34, and I'm going NC State 20. 34 to 20, good guys. Scott. Well, I actually, I want, I have a uniform that I want to see state wear. I got, I, I like the all black look. With agree. Either with the toughy or the slobbering wolf. Because I think the slobbering wolf is unbelievable. Now, because I want that, they won't wear it. They'll probably wear red, some kind of contraption like that, just to irritate me. So, honestly. I, I get irritated by Duke wearing black bottoms and white tops and all that. That just it just doesn't do anything for me. Um, if you're going to do black, go all black out. So anyway, I'm going to go white out. Um, agreeing that the helmet is probably not going to be the D. It'd probably be Gothic or, I mean, do we break out a Hellraiser? I mean, is that something we may pull out this weekend? Now, folks, if you remember the Get to Know You Coaches pod, we had mentioned that to Manny, or Josh did, actually. You saved the Hellraiser for State, Carolina, and Wake, even though they broke it out for Middle Tennessee. I I, I agree, Scott. I think it would be a perfect time to break it out. You know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to well, go ahead. That is the combo from Middle Tennessee, Icy White with the uh, Hellraiser. Okay, so I'm going to actually take it a step further. I'm going to go blue. White Hellraiser, white, white. You really want that blue. I mean, I thought I wanted the blue Hellraiser, Scott. That's like I your mean, third prediction that you're wanting it. I mean, I think I think it would be great. And if you put it up against even their red, I mean, the two helmets, those are two of the best helmets in the conference. I don't care what you say. Those are, to me, are two of the best helmets. Um. And it's actually funny. We're going to stay in the same uh, vicinity on the score as everybody else has done. So this is going to be great. If it works out any other way, we're all going to be a point or two off here, and it's going to be fun. Um, I do think Duke is going to go over to Raleigh again. Maybe the loudest atmosphere they hear all year. Now, plus and minus that, state fans are crazy. I mean, cuckoo, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, crazy. But – I love that. I love the fact that they're into it. They get, they enjoy themselves. They have a great time. They hate Duke. I understand that. They're going to think it's like Duke and PNC Arena with that orange ball. They're going to be that loud and that proud. Duke fans that are going to be there. I'm interested to see how much blue is going to be in the stands. Because I really think we're obviously we're going to have our sections where they put us in that corner. I think they're going to be pretty much full of Duke fans. But I'm going to say 31 20. I think that's about right. It'd be just over the over under um, Vegas. I'd like to know what you're drinking. Just so you understand. I have no idea in God's name, why you have them favored. I know you go home team three and under, but it started out at four. I think, didn't it, Brian? Wasn't it four Sunday? Was it three? I thought, I thought it was three and a half or something. Like okay, that. Yeah, it, anyway, it, it's in that vicinity. And then real fast, I'm going to do my PSA folks. If you follow me on Facebook, unfollow right now. I do not have Facebook anymore because I can't go into this because I'll get kicked this off YouTube. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not selling anything. My dad doesn't have all this crap. If he <laughs> did, I would have sold it already and I'd be a rich man. Okay. Wait, wait. Scott, I already sent him a $5,000 check. That wasn't you. And you know, the fact that those of you that actually played the game with my man, thank you very much. That was some hilarious responses I've seen, but I am not on Facebook. I cannot get on Facebook because they have blackballed me. Just for the record, I have been blackballed by Mr. Zuckerman, and I Z Zuckerberg. I don't care what his last name is. He's a hey, joke, he's Goku anyway. for Cocoa Puffs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, he anyway. I'll stop. But yeah, so if you follow me on Facebook, unfollow because I'm not that guy. I'm not selling anything, not yet anyway. 
if I if I start betting on Vegas and you know the lines that they give us, I may have to start selling some things. But that's not me. Yes, I know I've been hacked. Also, just for those of you that were wondering, I realize I'm hacked. I have nothing to do with it. Can't fix it. Facebook's one of those places where you cannot reach out to a human. And then when you try to sign up for another Facebook page, they blackball you because you pointed out to the fact that somebody's scamming you and hacking you, just for the record. So anyway, that last three minutes of my whatever, thank you all for listening. Have a great day. Yep. Scott is old enough to get hacked. And so uh, me and Brian will get there one day. We're not and quite I'm old not enough. not important either. I mean, I am one uh, of the most least important people in the world. And you hack me of all people? Seriously, well, you Zuck, really need Zuck, to do something with your pathetic The Zuckerman lives. thinks otherwise. The Zuckerman. Well, Zuck can, yeah. <laughs> oh, easy, 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 easy. Boy, all this right. episode's getting into TVMA status right it now. Is, My goodness. It is. Well, Jamie's listen, not here, up. so I was going to cuss for him, okay? That's right, that's right. <laughs> well, listen, we do miss Jamie. Uh, we do want to give uh, one, you know, quick, one more shout out to our Hellraiser sponsors, Bliven, uh Home and Realty. Uh, hometown air and home field apparel, right? So appreciate those uh, those guys for sponsoring us and for making sure our lights stay on. Brian, you ready to take us out of here, man? Yep. And another reminder, in case you fast forwarded through some of this episode, there will be no episode next week. We are taking the bye week to get some rest, to get ready for the final two games of the season. However, however, if you did not listen to last week's episode, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. There is going to be something that's going to be released, another behind-the-scenes video. What is it going to be about, you may ask? Well, I can't tell you. You're just going to have to wait and see when the episode gets released. I did talk with Tyler, our producer. He's in working on it right now, so it will be another good one. But with that being said, we hope to see as many of you as possible at Carter-Finley Stadium for the 3.30 kickoff against Tuffy and his Wolfpack. But that will do it for this episode. For Josh Cox, for Scott Medlin, for the absent Jamie Holt, and producer Tyler Witt, I'm your host, Brian Kennedy, and this has been another episode of the Duke Football Talk Section 17 podcast. Uh -huh.